Wszystkie łapki w górę. Jak mnie słychać? No to dobrze, teraz jest serwis przez mikrofon, nie będę nic kombinował. Cicho, bo mikrofon jest skierowany w stronę sceny, także myślę, że będzie dobrze. W najgorszym razie go wyciągnę. Wszystkie łapki w górę.
Thomas, would you like a beer? Enjoy. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, Brian, you have some 
and it is uh, my absolute pleasure to welcome our keynote presentation. And uh, it's not going to be your typical presentation. I think it actually will be a little bit off-centered. Uh, um, yeah. uh, just so that our Duckfish Head team can see again, raise your hand if you were on that excursion. Now, clap your hands if you had a good time. So, uh, I'm sure you know, the presentation, uh, our presentation is from Sam Calagione. And he has proudly, i put my sunglasses back on. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, he's proudly been focused on brewing beers with culinary ingredients outside the run uh since the day he opened up Fish Head as the smallest American craft brewery 22 years ago. Doc Fishhead has grown into a top 20 craft brewery. He's won numerous awards throughout the years, including the Wine Enthusiast 2015 Brewery of the Year and the James Beard Foundation Award for 2017 Outstanding Wine, Spirits, or Beer Professional. It's a 250-plus co-worker company based in Delaware with Doc Fishhead Brewings and Eats, an off-centered uh, brew pub and distillery. Chesapeake in Maine, a geographically enamored seafood restaurant, Dogfish Inn, a beer-themed inn on the harbor. Very comfortable beds, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, the uh, Dogfish Head Craft Brewery. <laughs> uh, production brewery and distillery fe featuring a tasting room and food truck. So, food truck. Uh, Sam and Dogfish Head support the independent craft brewing sill, the definitive icon for American craft breweries to identify themselves to be independently owned and carries the torch of transparency, brewing innovation, and the freedom of choice originally forged by the brewing community pioneers. So before I turn it over to our keynote, I also, hello, hello. I also want to uh, remind you all that we are about to have the largest Ask Dogfish event ever. Cool. So be prepared with your Facebook Live and Instagram Live, and you will be queued in. Sam will queue you, but look for the hashtag Ask Dogfish on your screen, and you'll know when to turn those uh, devices on. So without any further ado, and for the next hour or so, uh, Sam Calgon. stuff, but we will do this together. Uh, I want to just start by saying uh, thank you to everyone involved with the Beer Bloggers and Writers Conference uh, for inviting me to speak today. I want to thank my co-workers, uh, Heather and Janelle, who are representing all of us alongside me uh, today. I know uh, a lot of you got to visit us and got to see not just how special our properties and, and products are, but uh, the people that really come first and, and make what we do. So thanks for taking us. Uh, time out of your busy schedules. Uh, those of you that went on that journey, and for everyone that's in the room, I say thank you from every single one of the 7,000-ish indie craft breweries in America for being on the front line, shoulder to shoulder with us as brewers, to help us tell our stories, to articulate them, and to amplify them through, through your audiences. So uh, we are one of the ones that has maybe a larger than average voice in that group, but I, I know we all appreciate the work that you guys do in creating excitement in our community, so I, I thank you on behalf of all of us. Uh, so I'm going to focus the front side of the talk on uh, on, on Dogfish Head's uh, sort of approach to collaboration, community building, storytelling, uh, and then we're going to do something really fun all together in the back half of this bad boy, so here we go. So our story kind of started when I, I graduated from college in 92, moved to York City worked at a first gen beer bar while I was taking writing courses at Columbia. Uh, I was ho hoping to be a writer or a professor and uh, or, uh, as I was kind of paying my rent at that first gen beer bar and got to have good beers like Chimay and Sierra Celebration, I was smitten and within weeks started researching uh, home brewing, started home brewing and then started 
researching then in the uh, New York City Public Library. I did not know the internet existed yet. Uh, so I kind of was going to do my Lexus Nexus little DJ uh, search in there. Uh, and, uh, and I got to study that first great generation of indie craft breweries that helped get this movement going for all of us that preceded my brewery, certainly like Pierre and Sam Adams. And I saw they were doing beautiful things, making fresh local uh, beers here in America. But in general, something that they shared was they were mostly, uh, you know, utilizing modern European beer styles as the foundation of their brewery uh, uh, brand, their storytelling, whether it's awesome uh, American interpretations of English ales with Sierra or uh, German lagers with Sam. And I knew being 23, 24 years old and want to get a brewery off the ground that we were going to have to create a really unique, interesting story for it to stand out against these much uh, bigger uh, guys that started before us. So I really kind of glommed on to, as I did those searches and saw kind of the triangulations between uh, the, the early sort of local more food movement uh, and, 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 and the opportunity in the white space in beer. So looking at the works of folks like Alice Waters and, and James Beard, who had similar messages from different coasts, which were, let's stop genuflecting towards European traditions. We grow beautiful things here in America. We have amazing agricultural community. Let's create our own culinary uh, traditions here in America, utilizing our, our local uh, bounty. So that really was my epiphany moment, and I wrote a business plan around that, the first taste of which is sort of this extended dance remix of our of our company's mission statement, which we eventually shortened to off-center ales for off-center people. Uh, and the other, the second page of the business plan just said, we will be the first brewery in America committed to brewing the majority of our beers outside the Rhine Heights Kabot using uh, culinary ingredients, and that was True, we opened as the smallest brewery in the country, and it's still uh, true uh, today. So there, a lot of you guys know my, my bride, Mariah, is a pretty amazing person, and is really one of the original digital voices uh, in our community. Uh, I, you know, I'm proud to sort of be the analog representative of our company and our voice, and I love coming to events like this, or hosting beer dinners, or writing books, or, or uh, doing TV stuff. But Mariah is the one day in, day out, really making sure our voice is robust and vibrant uh, in, the, in the digital world. And she's done that uh, since really for two decades. You know, we, we got www.dogfish.com. We opened 95. Soon after that, she started figuring out ways to communicate virtually uh, as, as, as time went on. Um, you know, and I, I often say she's an angel. She glows. I look over at night in bed, and she's literally glowing, not just because she's an angel, but because shit's going off on the West Coast, and she's on her phone. <laughs> Doing, doing her magic uh, over there at pretty much every night. So uh, she, when I talk about our voice and our brand building, it really does start with both of us. And we, you know, started, you know, making out in the mid '80s. We were 16 when we started dating each other. So in essence, we kind of grew up together, which essentially we became adults together and figured out our sensibilities, our our sense of humor together as we were growing up. So that really has made it seamless for us to. To, to, to create a voice that does, you know, I think resonate as, as authentically uh, because we, we kind of grew up creating that voice and figuring it out uh, as a couple and then we're lucky enough to, uh, to, to find great people with complementary skills to ours to join us on our journey and add to that sort of storytelling acumen. But I would, I would sort of summarize our unique voice um, is one that is always about uh, celebrating innovation, celebrating collaboration, uh, with, a, with a lot of humility. We're very proud of the risks we take in innovations, but we're not, you'll never hear us say, we're no, we're, 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 our beer is the best. There's no such thing as the best beer. Everyone's palate's different. So that humility in our voice, I think, is equally important to the pride that we take uh, in, in innovation. So um, another pretty uh, important moment in the, in the history of, of, of beer, uh, that is the tablets of the original hymn to Ninkasi. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys know about him to Nikasi, but it really is sort of the OG beer blog uh, from 1800, uh, BBC, uh, 1800 BC. I'm going to read this part, uh, but it says, like so many stories and legends in the craft brewing renaissance, the hymn to Nikasi was preserved in oral form first uh, because it had become a popular song and it was finally committed to write. When you read it in translation, you see it has a light-hearted tone of of voice and its praise of drinking and a goddess many people admire no doubt contributed 
to its preservation. And so again, you can see that communicators have been putting their distinct storytelling skills uh, to the service of celebrating beer literally since uh, the birth of civilization. And uh, you know, this audience knows it probably better than any audience in any room in the world, but you know, platforms may change, but the song stays the same. Uh, and so you guys are doing this noble work that was carried out by kind of the original uh, communicators, writers, record keepers of all of civilization. And beer's been part of that uh, since the, literally the birth of civilization. Um, so back to sort of our, 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 our um, summary sort of, our, of what I think is, is the DNA of Dogfish. It does come from the voice of our company and it comes from the voice of our coworkers. We updated, this is our raison d'etre, so that's our company's mission statement. And it used to be off-centered sales for off-centered people, but we do so much more than just beer, and we're equally proud of all of our coworkers, whether they work in our brewery, our distillery, our hotel, or our inn. So we wanted to update that mission statement to make it clear that we were talking about all of our coworkers and the work we do together. So we took that central term of goodness out of that Emerson statement and made sure it became part of our, our mission statement. But we also chose, uh, in the last evolution of this, to start it with, we are off-centered goodness for off-centered people, because at the heart of it, we want everybody to know, especially our coworkers, that we recognize our brand and what makes it special and what makes it stand out in a world of 7,000 brands isn't the products first, it's the people, the people that make them, the people that sell them, the people that share them, and the people that tell us the stories around them. I'm so happy that so many of you got to take time and visit Coastal Delaware a couple days ago and saw so many of the awesome storytellers at our company who may not, who are not maybe telling that story in digital form or writing it down, but much like for many, many decades or centuries of the hymn to Ninkasi, it started as an oral tradition and then eventually got codified and written down. And that oral tradition is carried on in every interaction that a coworker at Dogfish has, uh, has with our customers, with our distributors, with our retailers, with all of our, our shareholders. Um, so we're pretty proud, like I said, that uh, even today, uh, 23 years after we opened, our, 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 our reason to be has held firm. When we started 23 years ago, we would get laughed at at beer festivals, Why, you know, chicory, a coffee, and a, and a stout, or when we did the first uh, fruit IPA in America, April Hop, we had people come up to our booth and say, fruit belongs in your salad, not your beer, asshole. You know, so, right. And so we took some arrows in that era of the mid-90s by trying to do something really uh, distinct. Uh, but we stuck to our guns, we never dumbed down our beer, we never discounted our beer, and we were able to navigate a really difficult moment, because we, we opened essentially before the, right before that first shakeout era that the craft brewing world uh, came to. Uh, and, uh, you know, in that era, it was really different. The late 90s, much like we got to be honest, we're on the precipice of another shakeout moment here in this country. We see craft beer overall beers uh, sales are, are, are slowing, still growing, but slowing in the terms of craft. Um, and so we are on the precipice of another shakeout. But this era is so different than the first era Mariah and I and our coworkers lived in the late 90s. Because in that era, the craft beer uh, excitement was more of a niche phenomena. It was more media driven, more of a novelty, whereas this moment we're going to go through this shakeout together, it really is a mainstream movement and consumers are really going to decide uh, who makes it through this shakeout and who doesn't. And that will have nothing to do with scale. That's another awesome thing about this, this moment that we're in. There's going to be awesome tiny little tasting room oriented breweries that navigate this competitive moment just as there'll be you know, top 20 craft breweries that navigate this moment. But yes, there'll be uh, acceleration in closings that happen in the next few years, but everyone's really gonna be looking at the industry to see how they react to that. In a lot of ways, as the influences in our industry, they're gonna be looking at you and what you're writing and saying about this moment. And I think if we all focus on the fact of the vibrancy and continued growth of craft, instead of the fact that there's gonna be some more closings as consumers' economic Darwinism takes hold, we see which brands are going to make it through. As long as we celebrate those that are doing beautiful things and vibrant and focus on is craft growing, is it vibrant? Yes, there's going to be more turnover of breweries that go out of business and certain folks in the media are going to want to glom onto that story of, oh, look, it's the death knell for craft. But I'm confident that craft beer is going to continue to, to grow 
market share even as we navigate this competitive moment together. And you guys are going to be among the leaders as the catalysts uh, for connecting people to the breweries uh, that deserve uh, to make it through uh, this, this shake-up moment. Um, so sort of our points of distinction at Dogfish, talking to our, about our voice as a company or as a brand, but sort of the, it's inherent also in what we think makes our, our, our proposition with our products distinct. I mentioned that we are committed to making the majority of our beers utilizing culinary ingredients outside of the Rhine Heights Cabo, but we're also committed to using them in their whole and natural form. So there are many breweries that will lean into, you know, whether it's artificial or natural flavored extracts, uh, concentrates. But at Dogfish, we've created our own equipment, like these, you know, five foot high, essentially giant tea strainers, food grade stainless tea strainers that get dipped into our, uh, our, our Whirlpool, 200 barrel Whirlpool, where we're adding the black limes for sea quench and the sea salt, uh, the, the, the fresh chopped lemongrass and orange peels uh, for Namaste. And so we have to keep going back to this story as, as we as brewers might get sick of it, the way as you as writers might get sick of writing about IPAs. We gotta remember that you know 87% of beer drinkers out there aren't drinking craft beer. So while we might be sick of saying, hey, Dogfish spends a premium to use all whole natural ingredients, and when you come to Dogfish on the day we're brewing Namaste or Sequench, it looks more like a, a farm stand than it looks like a factory, because we're chopping this stuff, we stuff up, we convert it into old apple crust and crush the black lines. And our goal is not just to tell the story uh, to ourselves, but to really um, excite consumers to be part of that story so that they come, see it and hear it from our coworkers, and leave as evangelists and tell the story alongside us. So for example, later today, my coworkers at our table will be serving beers from our, our uh, some of your summer cooler, the cooler pack uh, that we re, uh, designed uh, uh, to help us tell that story. And it's a pretty cool story of sort of internal collaboration because a guy uh, from our company named CJ, uh, he, he's a cool guy, covered in tats, he works on our packaging line, uh, married to Cindy, who's one of our uh, sourcing agents at our company, and he loves Sequench, and he loves blending it with Lupa Lua, our coconut IPA. And he emails me and says, hey Sam, would it be cool if we came up with a mix pack so that you could take our, our more refreshing lower ABV summer beers and start blending them and just having fun with them with the lime and the coconut and, and, make, uh, <laughs> and, and, and make this awesome mix. And from the moment I got that email and started talking to my different Co-workers of hey, how can we this is an awesome idea? How can we make this come to life? And you know, uh, sales went out and started talking to our distributors about what will they race it, even though it wasn't in our original budget. Um, and uh, Cindy went out and started sourcing this unique cooler pack that is exclusive to us through to the end of 2019. That origami's up into a functional ice case. Then we sourced with the the real koozie company, and a, uh, a, a dogfish koozie that's designed and hidden in every pack like a cracker jack. Uh, box. Uh, all of that took place from the moment CJ sent me that email to when we showed the distributor the finished product with the pricing with a ship date was 79 days. And so projects like that, even as a top 20 craft brewery that yes, you kind of turn like a big old ship more so than we do like a, a windsurfer, those are the things that get me super excited at Dogfish. And that takes a tremendous degree of collaboration and strong communication internally, which again, uh, speaks to the need of being really, uh, you, you know, precise storytellers, and it shows that how many different people and how many different departments at Dogfish are part of that uh, storytelling trajectory. And then within that 12 pack, on the inside, you rip the top off, and it's a sweepstakes to enter a trip to our brewery for, for consumers. And how we wanted to make that fun and tie it back to our point of distinction that our beer, we do command the highest price of any. Uh, top 50 craft brewery in America. The average craft beer case via IRI sells for about $35. The average dogfish case sells for 52. So we always have to be saying why our beer is still a great value at a 40% premium over that of our competitive set. Well, when we do the sweepstake and people win a trip to come and stay at our hotel, the, 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 the central part of that is we're actually, they get there and we're giving them steel-toed shoes and safety glasses and they're gonna be chopping up the orange slices and crushing uh, the black limes and the old apple press and making these beers from hand, you know, shoulder to shoulder with our coworkers and seeing that our process is, is blissfully inefficient 
uh, in terms in terms of, 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 of could we make the beer simpler, cheaper, et cetera, but it's also you can taste the difference because we do uh, spend this premium to make what we make. So that's another way that we really want to have our, our, our customers come engage with our company and leave as evangelists and tell their our story better than we can uh, tell it alone. Um, so then I'll move to uh, an example of sort of external co communication. Before I do that, you know, I mentioned we are primarily a beer company. I think about 90% of Dogfish's uh, revenue and 95-ish percent of our profits comes from our beer business. But we're very proud, as Ryan said, to have a seafood restaurant, a, a brew pub that both have little R&D breweries and distilleries uh, in them. Uh, uh, and then we also have our Dogfish Inn that you guys got to stay in. And these really are, uh, uh, you know, uh, ha halos around our core business or brand. We love all our businesses equally, uh, but even these businesses understand we're a beer-centric company, and in essence, while we're all equals in storytelling, we understand that beer is sort of the, the lifeblood that allows us to make the investments in these support businesses. So it's a very symbiotic relationship between all components of our company. And then now switching more to a story of external uh, collaboration, uh, before we do some uh, magic together. Uh, but as, as a lot of you probably know, we are as much uh, music geeks as we are beer geeks at Dogfish Head. We've been proud to do collaborations with brand, bands as diver, diverse as Guided by Voices, Deltron 3030, Pearl Jam, Grateful Dead. Uh, and uh, this one was really meaningful to me. We, we at Dogfish, whether it's uh, internally or externally, within the, the craft brewing community or outside, we believe a lot more of the positive karma that comes with focusing on collaboration than we do in the negative energy that comes with focusing on competition. And we all know that it's a very competitive moment in our industry, but we work really hard to focus on, on innovating, celebrating what we do, find similar spirited artists uh, that we can work with in, 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 in mediums that we think will be complementary to what we're doing, and see what we can learn from them on this journey. And we are pretty sensitive even to uh, choosing sometimes if we collaborate with a bigger group like Grateful Dead, we'll intentionally find someone smaller like the electronica musician Juliana Barwick or even Guided by Voices so that we, we know we can learn as much from a smaller entity, artistic entity, as we can from, from a bigger one. Uh, and that goes with our collaborations as well. This year we'll, we did a collaboration the first half of the year with our friends at The Veil vale in Welcome. Richmond. Great, great beers. Uh, Matt and those guys. Uh, and uh, you know, we just sent out an email to our friends at Dewey Beach, Beach Company, like uh, three blocks from our brew pub, to say, hey, we want you to be the guest brewer of our Analog and Go-Go Music Fest uh, this summer. Uh, and then in the fall, Mariah and I are going to Asheville to brew with our buddies Ken and Brian Grossman, a bigger company. So even with that stuff, we were really conscious to try and learn and, and, and put our brand warm and fuzzies up against both bigger brands and smaller brands than us. It's a learning opportunity, and again, for that sort of carbon balance. So the one that we're really proud of that's in market uh, now is Dragons and Yum Yums. And we also have learned with collaboration that it has to be an equitable collaboration with both partners equally invested in the process. I'm not talking about dollars and investment, but passion, investment, and creative input investment. It needs to be a, 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 you know, a equitable. Uh, and I can give you an example, like when we did the collaboration with Pearl Jam, Nice, great man, I'm a big fan. But it started with, we got an email from Eddie Vedder, their manager, saying, hey, it's the 20th anniversary coming up of their first album. Eddie Vedder's a big fan of what you did with Miles Davis's family and the Fishes group, and they want to do a beer with you guys. And I was like, awesome, awesome. Well, I'm a big fan of, of Pearl Jam. I need to know, though, how directly involved will the band be? And just in an email, oh, yeah, yeah, they'll definitely be involved, definitely involved. And so we didn't really get a contract, like, you know, quantifying that involvement directly from the band. And yada, 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 at the end of the day, all I got was one sentence from Eddie Vedder to make that beer we did faithful. And it said, hey, Sam, love what you do with Miles Davis. Uh, our band, when we're on concert, we drink a lot of fruit porridge, Pinot Noir, and a shit ton of Corona. Can you, can you make something that tastes like a blend? <laughs> so that beer we did called Faithful, uh, it, we, we try to make it the same color, uh, love about or the same color scale as Corona. Uh, and then uh, we made it with... Uh, um, uh, certain fruits, currants, black currants, to give it that juicy red wine character. It was an all right beer, but you could feel in that project that the, the passion, equitable investment wasn't there. 
And you contrast that against what we just did with Wayne Coin and the Flaming Lips. Granted, if you go to Spotify, they maybe have a fifth of the monthly users as Pearl Jam does, but they're still big and they're still known for collaboration. Uh, you know, uh, and so the, they were so invested from the first uh, phone call with with Wayne, and he contributed the ideas for the for the ingredients, the yum yum berries, the dragon fruit. Uh, I, I I would send him packages. He would send me packages. He actually took all the ingredients and, and wrote songs incorporating the ingredients into the lyrics of the song. He he self uh, did the art for the record sleeve of the record that was released on Record Store Day. I flew into his home city of Oklahoma City, uh, and we went from record store to record store, talking about the beer, talking about the album uh, together. And then this thing hit the marketplace, and it, it sold amazingly well. Yes, the liquid's awesome, but how equitable and how much passion was invested by all the collaborators, I think, gave the sort of karmic uh, uh, trajectory uh, to this beer that I enjoyed. So staying on that theme of collaboration and, and creative inspiration, there's going to be a little short film here. This shows, so, oh yeah, so we're announcing, I think, this week uh, that uh, we're doing a series called That's Odd, Let's Drink It, which I did a couple years ago with folks like Chris, Chris Bosch was on a few years ago, uh, uh, Mac Miller, the rapper. So this is sort of the lineup of this year's uh, guests that I get to hang out with and drink beer with. Again, this is an effort by Dogfish to do something that's in our voice with humility and humor, showing that we take beer very seriously, but don't take ourselves too seriously, and introducing folks that might not be associated with a hardcore beer geek demographic, and introducing, equally importantly, their audience to the excitement and diversity of craft beer. That's all the reasons behind us doing a, a project like that. Um, so here's a little uh, clip, clip of that, that uh, uh, Jimmy William Coin that's sort of I think on subject here for us. So this is collaboration, not litigation, from Avery Brewery and Russian River Brewery. The craft brewing industry is 99% asshole free. <laughs> and these two are helping us keep our odds together. There's a great story that kind of personified that, where unbeknownst to either of them, they both decided in the like 2005 to name a beer Salvation. And instead of like lawyering up and getting the yeah. trademark wars, they yeah. said, how about we do our, our each do salvation and let's do a blend of our salvations and call the beer collaboration, not litigation. Wow. It really is that idea of it, instead of being like, you're not my enemy. If you're you know, if you're doing what I'm doing and you might do it better than me, then you're my enemy and I should I should destroy you. I think when creative people are around other creative people, they love it. I always sort of say it's, it's like having our superpower. You're helping me. You're giving me energy. You're giving me ideas. You're making me rethink the things that I had doubts about. Yeah. And that's really the truth. Music has always been one of my biggest inspirations at Dogfish. So it's always been a dream of mine that my beer would inspire musicians as well. For this two-way collab, I teamed up with indie rock legends The Flaming Lips to create Dragons and Yum Yums, a tropical pale ale packed with dragon fruit, young berry, passion fruit, and black carrot juice. Lead singer Wayne Coyne then wrote lyrics inspired by the group for a special release called The Story of Yum Yum and Dragon, pressed into super limited vinyl records, injected with the beer itself. There's music in the beer, and beer in the music. Literally. So our first conversation, where I threw out some ingredient ideas and you didn't say that was stupid, and I'm like, ooh, I kind of like where this is going. The next sentence out of your mouth was, well, if we do a vinyl for records for today, you put beer in the vinyl. Yes. And I was like, yes. Who could that really happen? Well, see, I'm coming at it from, well, I don't know how it could happen, but I know it could happen for sure, because we've done, it wasn't a seven inch, yeah. but it was a bigger record filled with human blood. See, and this goes back to that brief time where Warner Brothers said, you can do that. We, we, <laughs> we as Warner Brothers can't allow you to make well, we a record. Can that's yeah. how you do we that. can allow you to make a record that actually has human blood in it. And the blood that was in it was the characters, the actual people that are on the record, you know. So I've got 
Jim James, I've got Chris Martin from Coldplay, I've got Kesha's blood, actually their blood. <laughs> we put a lot of our blood, sweat, tears, our hard work totally, yeah. into what we make. So and it, and it is, I mean, it is a strange thing to see. I mean, you think these days all the things that can be made, it is still, yeah. it's still a fascinating thing to see. Super cool, look at it, behind the barrier, behind the mud, <laughs> right? Craftsmanship is the process, not the product. I have enjoyed this process with you immensely. So that's just a, a good example we think of. Yeah. Great important, everybody. Great important. We think that's a good example of just how rewarding a deep collaboration can be. I know there are tons of breweries finding their unique voice in different collaborations. I think it's worth recognizing and and celebrating as we go through this uh, community together. So, with that said, we're now about to embark on a historic occasion. We are going to attempt, and I think succeed, at hosting the biggest ever Ask Dogfish. So this is our way of recognizing uh, uh, that we have much to learn from our customers about Dogfish Head as they do uh, from us. So every month now, for I think at least half a decade, uh, we do an Ask Dogfish, where we just send out a bat signal digitally, invite people to uh, send us questions, and then I uh, don't get the question for sometimes within a few minutes, uh, you know, half an hour before I get some of the question, and we kind of figure out how to answer them. But in a, in a sort of spirit of amplifying our voices collectively, our ask is that we do this all together in this room. I may have uh, screwed this up, Sarah, to go from this to, oh, no, I didn't. Good. So this is the thingy that lets you experts know how to participate, right, Chanel? Yep. Is there anything more I should say about that? You just need a chair. Okay. We're all going to do this together, guys. Don't say I didn't give you anything. There's a hat there. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully you guys can help us kind of what Wayne was saying about complimentary superpowers. So I hope you guys will put up your bat signals to your audiences now, and we can make this thing hit the most ears and eyeballs that have ever been done in the five years that Dogfish has been doing this. I'm going to double up with two beers. What do you want me to do? This, this big mic? guys who submitted questions in advance. Um, we couldn't take all of them because we want to do take some live questions to answer your question for me. If you have one, we're going to switch over to live question portion after the session. So with that said, we're going to go live on Jogfish and I hope you guys join us. Come on guys, raise them up. It's a thick lighter and R-E-N-T-E -E wagon. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we are live on Jogfish social channels. Sam, can you say hello to the interwebs? Please? Hello, interwebs! We're going to do this! You're about to be part of history if you're watching. We're going to break all records for Ask Dogfish together. Perfect. So our first uh, submitted question comes from Julia at the Brewers Association. <laughs> Sam, why do you think the Brewers Association independent craft brewer seal is important, and what can beer lovers do to support it? Oh, I, I, okay, so I do think it is Important, and we do have that uh, seal on our packaging at Dogfish. I do think it is an important line in the sand in the beer craft brewing community, but I think there's really good people on, on both lines, of, of, of both sides of that line. It has nothing to do with the, you know, the, the spirit, the integrity, the passion of anyone who works at a brewery that falls into the BA's definition or anyone that works at a brewery that falls outside. But I do think it's an interesting moment in our, uh, in, 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 in our, in our, our, the commercial landscape of craft beer, where, you know, that first shakeout era, the late 90s, when Dogfish lived through it, when I looked left and right to me, in Mariah, it was pretty much all entrepreneurial mom and pop breweries that were kind of fighting, you know, shoulder to shoulder uh, to move through that moment. Today, if you look at IRI defined craft beer, I'd say somewhere around half of the top 50 are actually brands that are wholly or majority owned or controlled by one of the three or four of the world's largest breweries. And there's nothing wrong with some entrepreneur wanting to monetize their lives work 
and sell out to a big brewery. I think the challenge is that there's a tremendous lack of transparency about who really controls these brands that are being presented as if they come from still tiny little independent uh, craft breweries. So my belief is that this shield, this seal, uh, is a way that consumers can, can gain that transparency and vote with their own pocketbooks and wallets. In other words, if you see a brand with a seal and you're like, I don't give a shit, that IPA that doesn't have a seal is $4 cheaper, I'm just going to buy that. That's cool. You should be able to do that. But you should also be able to know when you make that decision who truly makes the beer uh, that you are, are buying, who, who the company is that makes it. And it's cool to see it starting to get traction. I think it's over 70% of the beers sold by indie craft breweries are, 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 are uh, embracing the, the, the seal to some regard. I think recent, recently it shows that uh, in IRI data, indie craft beer is growing at about 3%, and the brands of the acquired breweries are growing about 1.5% year to date. So it's awesome to see more and more consumers uh, recognizing that they, they have a choice and you should just keep asking for more uh, transparency and I think the, the shield uh, bubbles that, that expectation up. All right, this one comes from Alicia Fuller from the Fuller Existence, did I get that right? Fuller Existence, okay. With the release of mixed media, which contains the highest percentage of wine possible for a beer, is this a foreshadow of Sam branching out into the wine industry too? He already has beer and spirits, so dot, dot, dot. Ooh, yes. So, yeah, we've had a lot of fun, uh, you know, trying to push boundaries in, the, in our 23 years of existence. And the federal government does define beer as it has to be at least 50.1% fermented from grain. Uh, so this, uh, this was our way to walk as close to this line in the sand between beer and wine as we could. We say this beer is barley legal. Uh, it's, I think, 50.1. Uh, and then it also has uh, Viognier and a lot of great great uh, uh, influence in it in sort of a Saison base. Yes, we're going to keep experimenting uh, with beer wine hybrids. I think we were the first to kind of uh, nationally distribute one with Midas Touch starting in 1999. I believe that's now the best-selling honey uh, uh, beverage in the country, a mead, mead beer. Uh, hybrid. Uh, and this winter, I don't know if I'm supposed to announce this or not, but uh, we do our IPAs for the holiday mix pack, a 12 pack, class 12 pack. And we had 61, our sort of red wine infused uh, IPA in there last year, fermented with Syrah grapes. This year it'll have 61 in it, 1690. And a new beer we have that's called Viniferous IPA. There's vines in the front of that word for sure. And that one's made with Riesling, Viennai, Viennai grape must and these really neat sort of Blanc and Melon uh, German hops that throw a lot of melon character into the beer. So look, so that pack will have sort of the white wine IPA and the red wine centric IPA in it. So look for that coming at you this fall. This one comes from Chelsea Markle. Uh, with close to 6,700 craft breweries and counting, has Dogfish had felt the effects of the increase? And if so, how? i.e. in distribution, tap space at bars, at their brewery or brew pub, other? Yeah, I mean, we, were, uh, we talked about this a little bit when we were all, a bunch of us were at Dogfish, and Paul and I were talking about uh, a little bit of the tap room component uh, at the beginning of this. I, I think, yes, it does affect all breweries. It affects our industry. And I, I kind of call it the smiling jaws of death. Uh, <laughs> That makes it sound so much nicer than just the jaws of death, uh, which just means, hey, yeah, shit's getting real, but we better have fun and do what we love doing while shit's getting real. And when I think of jaws of death, this moment that we're in, it's basically the, the lower jaw of death is all these the little teeth of the, say, 2,000, 5,000 barrel less tap room oriented breweries. And that's going to be a very strong business model during this shakeup, because in essence, they're kind of like a cockroach in a nuclear storm. Uh, they'll survive anything and because, because they have awesome economic power. Every, every case, every four-pack of 1999 AZ IPA they, they sell, they keep their margin, the distributor margin, the retailer margin. That's a beautiful thing. It means they can invest and grow their brewery. And if they want to get to some multi-state uh, platform someday, they'll likely be relying on, on three-tier distributor partners to do that. Um, but it means that that is a really strong economic model. And then you kind of have the top job of that which is sort of the 50-ish 
uh, IRI to find craft brands. Again, not all of them are owned by independent craft breweries, but those craft brands, many of which have the resources of the biggest global breweries, so they don't have to be as concerned with profitability in the next two or three years of this shakeup. They're going to be strong in this moment. But this moment is one where that space in between those two jaws of death is a really dangerous place where you can get chopped. If you call it kind of between, in general, 5,000 and 100,000 barrels, there's going to be awesome success stories of brands that just started a year or two years ago that are going to make it from that lower jaw through this dangerous moment onto that upper jaw. That's what they aspire to. If they want to stay small as a tasting room brewery, I'm sure they're going to be awesome at that too. But the reality is, as competitive as it's gotten, and with access to market, access to distribution, access to ingredients that the world's biggest breweries have and the brands that they sell as craft brands, there's going to be a lot fewer dogfish heads, stones, and bells that make it from that lower jaw through that gauntlet to that upper jaw today, I believe, than there were even 10 years ago. All right, this one comes from Ryan Newhouse. If home brewing and craft beer never came into your life, what do you imagine you'd be doing today for a career, and where do you think you'd be living? Rapping? <laughs> In my parents' basement. <laughs> That's a shameless plug for if you go to Amazon, I think it might be up on iTunes now. The Pain Relief has just released a new single called Boys and Girls of Summers, and with a wonderful guest vocal by Julianne Barrow, the musician we're doing one of those shows with. Uh, no, I probably would not be a rapper. I'd hope that I'd I followed that original uh, dream I had to be a, a teacher uh, or, or a writer. Uh, that's probably a, a, a high school or a, a English teacher, a literature teacher would probably be what I'd love to be doing if I wasn't lucky enough to be doing this. From Joel, I'd love to know if Sam has any advice for small startups on the information side of brewing, stuff like brewing directories, beer check-in apps, brewery job boards, etc. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I started with copies of Zymergy, you know, when, when I was uh, writing my business plan, and uh, uh, so the evolution of that information is uh, available at brewersassociation.org, which is more of the, uh, the industry-facing startup side of the VA than craftbeer.com. So I think that's probably the number one resource because you can also go from there to click on to buy awesome books, like Dick Cantwell's book on how to open a brewery uh, or uh, the new Gozo book that's coming up by Val Allen. Um, I would also say I'm a big fan of, of Beer Advocate and sort of understanding longer form than you might get on, on untapped, what some opinions and trends are in our industry at a very, in, in a very independent uh, site, one that doesn't have any ownership by a big brewery. That's a really great place for the independent voice of, of, of uh, beer lovers. Uh, some favorite uh, maybe books of mine, I love uh, well, I think you got to start with the the the, 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 the sort of the, the major two, which is Joy of Home Brewing by Charles Papazian and uh, you know uh, Michael Jackson's uh, famous book. Anyone who starts a brewery, I would start from there for the beer liquid side, but business and beer side. You know, uh, Beyond the Pale by Ken Grossman's a great story of a pioneer. Beer School by Tom uh, Tom Potter and, and Steve Hindy would be one that I'd recommend. Bring up a business. An awesome book worth reading as well, I think. Uh, so I hope that helps. All right, from Jeremy. I'm curious about what the biggest flop of a beer that taught you the most was and what was learned in the process. Oh, yeah, we got, I could go on for hours about all the things that have not worked at Dodgers. Uh, this might be racially profiling myself, but we brewed a beautiful beer, beer called Garlic Brett, B R E A D T H, because we added this black rock fermented garlic to every tank, the whole breadth of the production of it, from hot side to fermenter to bright tank. It was so awesome with pasta. It sold like shit. No one wanted to drink it. <laughs> and then like 15 years ago, when we, like probably every brewery, small brewery, gets asked by their local sports bar chain to do a green beer for St. Patrick's Day, I was like, all right, most people, we'll give you green beer. And uh, we did a beer called Verdi Verdi Good, with green algae, blue green algae, and it tasted like pond scum. <laughs> we ended up, we ended up, it was vibrant green, but it really did taste and smell like pond scum, so that one didn't sell so well. Recently, you know, we've done a lot with 
Sours, I'm proud to say Sequench Ale is the, the, the number one selling sour beer in America. Sours are now the fastest growing beer style in America, albeit on a smaller base than IPAs. They're up 40% year to date, and we've been doing sours since we won a World Beer Cup medal for Festina Lente, uh, I think 12 or 14 years ago, every year. Uh, so recently, a bunch of my coworkers in our small batch program wanted to do a really unique, unique take on sour that also had the DNA of the traditional British style of oyster stouts. But stouts have been done. We won a GABF medal with our Chalk Lobster beer, with lo Lobster from Maine. But their own take on it was to do a goza uh, using snails, not just the mineral-rich shells, but the actual meat. Uh, the beer was called Escar Goza. <laughs> yeah. And we were like, this name's awesome. We're like, oh, the beer is terrible, man. <laughs> but we're not giving up on that. That one might get made again. But that's some recent examples of some epic fails, and our goal is just to keep, keep, keep pushing the boundaries, keep failing forward, keep taking risks. That's why at Dogfish, we have a 10-gallon brewery anyone in our company can brew on, a 5-barrel, a 7-barrel, a 100-barrel, and a 200-barrel, so that while we're painting our, you know, Monets and uh, Red Noirs on the 100 to 200, a bunch of co-workers are doing their Jackson Pollocks and throwing shit on the wall of the, the 5 and 7-barrel breweries, and so that, that creates spirits alive in the well and looking forward to our future failures as much as our future successes. So that's it for the submission part of it, and we're gonna to switch to the live one, and our first one that we're gonna go live with is Carla, the beer babe. All right, Carla. Um, so you're in a room full of writers. Yes. Um, Stories that I wish would get told about our brewery. You know, Mariah mentioned this in the smaller room uh, when some of us were together. But uh, you know, the, a lot of what consumers sees is the work of sales and marketing. They get to taste the results of the what they consider to be the brewers. But I'd say the unsung heroes uh, in the departments at production breweries are the QA lab and the packaging people. And if we had more opportunity to talk about how difficult those jobs are and how much creativity they're bringing to things, even just like scheduling. You know, oh, we were budgeted to do this much of this beer, but now we're doing this much of this one and this little of that, and the massive game of Tetris that they play, and that how that can wreak havoc on QA and QC unless you're a top of your shit. Uh, and we have a full-time PhD in chemistry at Dogfish, a full-time PhD in biology at Dogfish, over a million dollars in beautiful, amazing Star Trek looking shit in our lab at Dogfish. So I wish I got to talk more about that, and I'm glad I did today. So, thank you. Thank you. Question over. She's here. Uh, I got a question for you. I heard an interview with you uh, four or five years ago, and I'm not going to ask you to remember everything you said four or five years ago, but this stuck because it had to do, this was paraphrasing, you said something to the effect of someone was interviewing you about this boom and all these breweries opening up everywhere, and you said, you know, I don't care about them opening up. It's more that if somebody's first experience is with one of these breweries where people just went in for the money grab and not the passion about the brew, some, some customer is going to have that as their craft beer experience, yeah. and it's going to be over for them. Five years later or so, you remember saying something like that? Yeah. yeah. And has it become a problem? You know, I think the, I think we're, I'm not kept up at night about that because there's so many choices now with the average American living within 10 miles of probably not just one brewery anymore, but two or three, that the consumer is going to decide. You guys are going to help amplify the awareness of the ones making awesome and innovative beer, and you'll either be silent or rightfully criti critical of those that aren't. But I always say a world-class brewery today, it's harder to open a world-class brewery today uh, than when I opened you know, 23 years ago. There's really the three kind of pillars, I think, of a successful business model for a brewery, regardless of what scale you aspire to. And it's that you gotta be firing on all three cylinders of quality, consistency, and being well differentiated. And I think when we started, the consumer beer education was such that you were forgiven a lot, because people did not have a lot of awesome choices, and they did not have the beer education or access to your work or untapped or beer advocate. To, to find really good beer. Um, and you could get away in the mid-90s with firing on one or two of those three cylinders. But I think today, regardless of scale, any brewery that's gonna open, there's always room for another awesome brewery to open in any major town in America. 
if they're firing on all three of those cylinders. If you're trying to open a brewery today and you don't care about any of those or only some of them, do the 7,000 us a favor and just stay at home with it because it'll reflect badly on all of us. Yes, uh, while touring the Rehoboth Beach Brew Pub yesterday, we saw a young man in there scrubbing the floor and sweating. Um, are we hopeful that's the next generation of dogfish? Uh, uh, yeah, so that's Sammy Kelly-Joni the fourth, I think you met there, who uh, reports up to Brian Selders, who runs our Rehoboth uh, Brewing uh, program. Yeah, and there's a kid, you know, he's 18 years old. So Brian and I certainly don't want to put the weight of the world or the weight of our world on his shoulders right now. We never, you know, our work life certainly with both of us being a dogfish leads into our home and we don't try to mince words or not talk about work at home, but we try to talk more about the ways dogfish that contributes back to the community or, you know, works with farmers or the creative side of recipes. So then we try to talk about the last trademark battle we were in or whatever the unfun stuff that we have to do at work is. And our daughter's chosen to work in a vintage record and clothing store, but our son on his own chose to work at Dogfish. And four or five years ago, I was on a panel with uh, the, the V-52s for record store day. And my son was there with his buddy, so he was probably 13, 14 years old then. And at dinner that night, his buddy was like, isn't that cool that your dad gets to hang out with you? And for his job, hang out with V-52s. And when your son's 14, you're, you're, you're usually his dad. Antichrist, right? And at dinner that night, he goes, when his buddy says, don't you want to work at Doug or something? He's like, I'll tell you what, the last place I'll ever work in the world is uh, um, at Urban Outfitters, because they're stealing all the good vinyl from the independent record store. <laughs> he said, the second to last place in the world I'll ever work is Dogfish Head. The third to last place I'll ever work um, is um, for uh, Al-Qaeda. Okay. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, I'm a patriotic man, and I'd rather work for them than work for Dogfish Head. <laughs> wow, that's a strong word, Sammy. Uh, and then his skater buddies ended up working at Dogfish and told him it was a really fun place to work. So without even telling Ryan and I, he went and applied to be a food runner there. And he's worked there every summer. And last summer he worked in their QA lab, his choice. This summer he said he wanted to work in brewing. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can. Uh, that, that we can keep an environment where our, our kids can be involved in, in Dogfish Head, but they have to be willing and able. They have to be both equally. They can't be given that opportunity. They've got to earn it, and uh, time will tell where we'll go. And I'm proud, proud of both our kids. I'll let you finish up the next one. Oh, over here. What's your favorite Italian, Italian dish, and what beer does Dogfish Head have that pairs perfectly with it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it would be my mom's shrimp scampi, which she cooks every Christmas Eve, and it, you know, I would like to have garlic breath with it, but <laughs> management killed that idea. <laughs> uh, and I would say, for my mom's sake, her favorite beer that we do is Shelton Pale Ale, which we rarely do, but was one of our first beers, and we brewed it again at our pub this summer. Uh, I'd love to see myself bring some crowlers and Shelton Pale Ale home on, New Year, on Christmas Eve to shrimp scampi with my, my family. Uh, I'm going to select two and break the rules. Oh. All right, one here and one back there. Go ahead. Okay. I'll do quicker answers. All right. There's probably less of my generation that appreciates craft beer. So as a blogger, how do we educate boomers to appreciate the nuances of craft beer? Because it can be pretty intimidating to walk into a place and see 68 taps yeah. and decide, what do I want? Yeah, good question. Well, I mean, I would say, you know, for any, when you're trying to reach a specific audience, you got to think about what's important to that audience to cater the message to them. And I think it's probably safe to say that most folks, as they're in retirement years and not generating income, are probably more thoughtful about what they're spending their money on. So to just go in from the position of, hey, you know, becoming a beer aficionado um, is a lot uh, it's a, a affordable luxury compared to trying to seek out and enjoy the world's finest wines. So if you can build a library or a cellar around the world's finest beers and how they compare with brewed as well as the world's finest Bordeaux, it's a pretty affordable luxury and, and something that you can leave to your children uh, with certain vintage beers. That might be a route that I'd go. One back here. Orange hat.
something too terrified to put in a beer. Uh, we've done Scrapple. Usually when I think of that thing, my, the other part of my brain goes, fucking dare you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I better not, I better just keep it on the inside. Right now. Uh, but it's another bodily fluid that we have to talk about. <laughs> I better keep that on the inside. <laughs> Let's end with one better, one better one than bodily fluids. I don't want to end on bodily fluids. Last one. So, so you've worked a lot with uh, musicians. Yep. Musicians yep. for years. Any musicians or from the past that you would have liked to have worked with, or, or yep. part of pieces of music that you would like to make? That's a good question. Um, I'm reading a book of uh, interviews of Bob Dylan did uh, recently, and that talk about someone who marched to his own uh, tune. And, I uh, wasn't afraid to go outside of expectations of him as he had creatively evolved. I understand that he's done a deal now with a spirits company and he's doing a whiskey. So he didn't, Bob didn't take my calls in terms of management. But that was, I would have loved to have done one with Bob Dylan. And I'm emailing today with a, a, a musician uh, that probably doesn't have recognition of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a Bob Dylan or a Grateful Dead, but it's someone who's got an album coming out this fall that I'm trying to work on uh, doing something. So yeah, there'll be more awesome announcements of fan collaborations uh, coming from Dogfish uh, in November, the first stuff we're excited about coming out in 2019. So with that, I've been, uh, I'm sorry I took up a little more time, but I, I, I could do this all day. Uh, you guys are brothers and sisters of mine and my 380 coworkers in our efforts to really celebrate everything that's awesome about the craft brewing community. I, I thank you guys for all your evangelism and, and work. So. Cheers. Have a good day. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Sam. Thank you. Get off the stage. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> Anybody who wants to do a picture of Sam in front of the beer bloggers and writers conference uh, sign, he's here for five minutes. Five minutes. Right. What am I doing? I look at a beer. Yeah, I got to show their smile. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And at 2.40, we're going to get started with the Devil's Backbone uh, session right in here. We've got the hotel staff coming in right now to take away the dogfish head cans. Was it blurry in there? And uh, we're getting his mic off. We're all blurry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ja już selfiacza mam z sam, samem z browaru, także nie stawiam się w kolejce. Proszę zaskoczony, że tak słabo się klika. Oczywiście widzę, że nikogo z Ameryki nie ma. YouTube to jest jednak... Znaczy inaczej. To po prostu nie żyje w Ameryce. Nie wiem, o co chodzi. Ten cały live na, na Facebooku e, e, do Kwisza, gdzie jest 400 tysięcy fanów. Dobrze mówię? Tak. E, tam jest 400 tysięcy fanów i oglądało 100 osób. Takie piwa będą produkowane. Z Devil's Mode. De De Devil's Backbone. Aromaty w piwach typowe, w lagerach, z plusem T na plus, z minusem wady i tak dalej. I'm <laughs> sorry. 
Może, może zakończę tego live'a i odpalę następnego. Wtedy ludzie zobaczą, że e, jednak jest Tomasz Kopyra, a nie sam Kala Joint, to może będzie więcej widzów. <laughs>